I'll use the word Israel. You'll understand that I'm not talking about a country that exists in Palestine. I'm talking about the 12 tribes of Israel. So I'm going to use that to describe America or Canada or Australia or New Zealand. It's a synonymous term as far as I'm concerned. What's happening in this nation is just staggering and how it's come upon us so quickly as the undercurrent we see it's infiltrated. And God said that this would happen. You only have to read chapter 1 of the book of Isaiah and everything that I'm saying is what you're about to see. I'll just put this on just for a second. A family can be made up in many different ways. It's called SOGI for sexual orientation and gender identification, a curriculum that teaches public school students across Canada to celebrate the homosexual lifestyle and that gender is fluid. In other words, your gender is not dependent on what parts you were born with, but rather what you feel like in the moment. There's people that are boys, there's people that are girls. There are, peop there are people whose gender might be a little bit of both or might even be neither. Lessons include books about transgender children, such as 10,000 Dresses and songs like The Rainbow Song. Gender won't decide the choices we make. Some boys like dressing up, some girls like catching snakes. The SOGI curriculum started in British Columbia in 2016 and is quickly spreading throughout Canada. Abuse. All those beautiful qualities that make young girls beautiful girls and women are being basically vilified. The things that make our boys boys are being, you know, taken from them. Um, so things of equating young men to being strong protectors is something that's now evil. But Morgan Auger, a transsexual and supporter, claims it's about acceptance, not indoctrination. The idea is to teach kids that there are gay kids and there are trans kids and there are trans parents and gay parents in our society and, the, and everybody's wanted and desired. After all, that's what our human rights code says and it's the role of schools to teach the, to teach the following of our laws, right? Simpson disagrees, saying she sees Soji's real goal as... Altering our culture from a heteronormative society into one where anything goes, no boundaries, no values, no morals. Um, it's a hedonistic uh, cult, basically, what they're Im implying. Another blaring example, drag queen story time. It's happening in Canada and America, where some public schools and libraries invite drag queens, some dressed like horned demons, to read to young children. And it's a social deconstructionist agenda. They're using children, little five-year-olds, to accomplish this. And parents are waking up and saying no. When asked about parents' rights, OJ says... Well, actually, in Canada, parents' rights are limited and children's rights are put ahead. So the child has the right to be protected from the parents when the parents behave badly. Canada is known as one of the most gay-friendly countries in the world, with many of their largest cities featuring their own gay villages, like here in Vancouver, which has literally rolled out the Rainbow Road. Most gays, like village resident Dave Davy DiCarlo, support SOGI and limiting parental rights. The change that we have to see is sometimes the parents and the kids are doing actually really okay. This is very... With that as a backdrop, God said that he was not a man that he should lie nor the son of man that he should repent. It's very sad when we read in the scriptures, he made promises... He spoke about how that they would crouch down as a great lion and have the strength of the unicorn. And it would be said in that day, look what God hath wrought. And we had a very strong nation during a time, especially when the word of God was being fashioned and forged by blood, by faithful men that risked and hazarded their lives that we might have that word. And during the time of the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, no moral change had ever come over a nation anywhere in the world or to date like what came over Great Britain. Its manners, its politics, everything changed and it changed because of the word of God. And all our laws were founded on that reformation which brought Britain out of the darkness of Rome. And we've seen this rise 
in the blessing of God upon the nation as they embrace the word of God and now sadly as we've rejected the word of God we're seeing that this nation is losing its power it's losing its influence we've given ourselves over to all of our lovers it says in the word we've forsaken God the fountain of the living waters the Bible says and now we are drinking of waters that are from broken cisterns of very bitter waters we will reap this nation will reap what it sows that sounds pretty sad but of course we know the end of the story and we know that God will have his way and he will redeem a people he'll redeem the nation he'll redeem his people in the church I started this off about four days ago and I haven't been out of the words since this really probably is a culmination of 30 years of thinking and you bring some of these things up and people go oh yeah that's nice and today and over the next couple of days I hope to actually nail this thought you can come along the journey with me some of you may agree some of you may not this is an aspect of the Word of God that I feel answers itself the word answering the word I endeavor to do that if a thought comes up that can show me that perhaps I'm not on the right track then I'm more than happy to receive that because we need to be a people that can be instructed by the Word of God and not be anchored to perhaps tradition or just feelings of loyalty because we belong to a particular doctrine or a church and we forget that we need to have a heart that's malleable and soft and pliable to the Word because there's nothing in this world that can be trusted so much of what we hear on the net today is just wrong and you know people come and say oh, was this conspiracy or that conspiracy or another conspiracy and I think well who's got the time to check all of this out who knows yet I know that when I turn to the Word of God as it says in the scripture let God be true and every man a liar that's how I see it. I see that the word of God is truth. We can stand on that rock. And so we have two identities. The main theme, of course, in the Old Testament and the New. You can't separate the two. Which Yahweh, Jehovah and Israel. In the New Testament, we have Jesus and the church. Some people understand that that's not a word that is really in the scripture we see it in the King James Bible and I'm a fan of the King James Bible just to put you at ease if I do use the word church it does also refer to the assembly or the congregation which incidentally the words assembly or congregation are the words that in Tyndale's Bible he would reference look we can move on from this but sadly the word church does come from pagan origins and is linked with the word Cirque as in Kirk some churches sadly are a bit of a circus today when we talk about the relationship that God had with Israel and that the church has with Jesus Christ then really we're talking about the Trinity here aren't we we're talking about trying God and just this little statement earth and sky and water became the thunderous symphony now when you look at the earth it has moisture in the earth and there's air trapped in the soil and in the sky we have dust and particulate matter which is the earth in the sky we also have moisture so whenever you put on your air conditioner you'll notice that water comes out the back that's the water that's being removed from the air and then water itself has in the ocean of course it's distilled it hits the mountain tops or it comes off the snow it takes the minerals and everything with it and also fish can breathe in water because of the air so there's this trinity aspect if you like and there's so much overlap unfortunately what we saw is typified in these scriptures and that the way that the Lord feels the way that the Lord feels about this current state of the nation God wanted to dwell in the holy place he said he sought truth on the inward parts and instead he's forced to dwell in the midst of deceit well he's not going to do that and what breaks his heart is the fact that this nation is at the point now where it's been so distracted by uh, that the world even as it says in the book of Deuteronomy you know see that you forget not the Lord thy God when you be born into the lands and you be increased with wealth and goods and they've forgotten the Lord because they've waxed fat the Bible says and kicked therefore the Lord of hosts says behold I'll melt them 
And we saw how that the children of Israel is described that when they're in Egypt that they were put through a fiery furnace. That purged them. It refined them. And that's how the Lord will deal with this nation. At the same time, there's another part of God's heart which just desires his people. How could I give you up, O Ephraim? How could I surrender you, O Israel? How could I make you like Admar? And how can I treat you like Zeboim? My heart is turned within me. My compassion is stirred. And God remembers Ephraim when he was a child and how he taught him to go and how he held him by the hands. And that memory he can't dismiss. But he must have his word fulfilled. That even the priests and those that are Levi, how they will be refined. And it talks in here how God views, uh, sadly, uh, this people as dross. What does that mean? Well, when we melt steels and coppers and metals, what happens is all of the rubbish, it comes to the top. And it's not the pure. It's what they call a slag in those terms. And nobody really wants that. Of course, we can get other stuff out of it, but eventually that will get tossed. So burning lips and a wicked heart. So when you meet people that would talk about God, but really, when we do see politicians, unfortunately, which would say they are Christian, or they would say that they have a godly disposition, but really they're feeding the narrative of what we just saw before. They're, they're not dashing the thoughts that would bring this nation down. As it's I attend, uh, without me, they shall bow down under the prisoners. We need the Lord, don't we? This is a prophecy, O Assyrian, rod of mine anger, and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. Why is there going to be a judgment? Because we become a hypocritical nation. And against the Lord speaks about the people of his wrath. I'm going to talk about the covenant. And besides all of this, the fact that the Lord has held out his hand all day long, there is a covenant, and this is the reason why he's doing this, because he made a covenant. He wanted to destroy Israel at one time, but Moses stood in the gap. He was the mediator of the Old Testament. He stood in the gap, and he pleaded with the Lord for Israel. And he said, for his name's sake, and for the promise that he'd made in the covenant. The covenant is very important to God. The Greek word here, diatheke, I don't know if that's the right pronunciation, was the term that was used in the Septuagint. It translates from the Hebrew word berith. We know all about that word berith, don't we? Of course, that's where we get our word Britain or British, which is covenant land or covenant people. And so we see this word almost without exception has that word diatheke in the Greek rendered the word covenant. We see in the Bible the Old Testament and the New Testament. We can call it the Old Covenant and we can call it the New Covenant. And so the main words that can describe what this covenant is, is of course covenant, or a promise. But it's not just a promise. This was one of the difficulties with the word. It's a compound word. It absorbs so much. Testament, which I've discussed, witness. It is a witness of the contract that God has made with us. It's a witness of what God does for his nation. It's, if you like, the proof or the guarantee. You could even use the word guarantee. An agreement. It's also the fulfilment. So God will fulfill the contract with us. And Jesus Christ is, has been the fulfilment. It's the new fulfilment of what was happening with the old covenant. Also a pledge. We talk about the earnest of the pledge, which was the exchange, which was the exchange. Jesus gave his life, and if we give our life to him, then we've entered into that pledge. And one that could be seen, perhaps, one that could be seen as a little controversial, marriage. It's also a marriage. And so God married Israel. And we know that's not too hard. What are you talking about, Was That's not too hard, a controversial word. I can accept that. Well, maybe as we go on in the New Testament, that might be a problem. But anyway, let's talk about that. Whatever happens, 
God is not finished with Israel. In fact, he's issued his word and it will accomplish that which it was sent to do. If God said it, it will happen. And even though this nation may have, have drifted away from what the Lord would have wanted, he will get his way. I have sworn by myself the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness. It shall not return that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear, declaring the end from the beginning, from the ancient times, the things that are not yet done. As we've seen prophecy and history unfold, it confirms his word. He says, his counsel shall stand, and I, God, said he will do all his pleasure or all my pleasure. So it doesn't matter what man does. It doesn't matter how much the forces of evil care to stand against what God will do. He will just blow them away as he opened the Red Sea. I just want to talk a little bit about the word covenant and testament so that we can see the nuances of both of those things. Martin Luther, the famous reformer, when quoting Jerome said, namely that in the Hebrew one finds covenant rather than testament. Luther explains why. Thus Jesus Christ, the immortal God, made a covenant. At the same time he made a testament because he was going to become mortal just as he is both God and man. So he made a covenant and a testament. Whoops, it's going backwards. He who stays alive makes a covenant, but he who is about to die makes a testament. I'll quote what other people are saying because they could be more eloquent than I can. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, so we know that Jesus was going to die during the early hours of the day on which he would die, God the testator was ready to make his last will and testament, which would put the inheritance into effect. Every time Christians go to the supper, they are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. They are acknowledging that Jesus, the God-man, died and that his death has put his testament into effect and that at his return, he will take his people to their ultimate inheritance. Every Bible reader, when considering the word diatheke, which is the Greek word there for the covenant, should look up words like adoption. Now, that's a word that I want to return to later. Blessings, inheritance, promises and son. One will also be amazed how many times the testamental ideas are presented in bereth, Hebrew word there. The above conclusions tend to reveal a need for permitting testament to overshadow covenant. Now, this was a consideration that was being made just over the word testament to covenant in the Bible, you know, uh, whether we should use the old covenant or the old testament. Just a note of how that was placed new within the Lord's Supper accounts indicates the idea of fulfilment, which we spoke about there. There's a couple of um, scriptures. I'm going to give this presentation to Perry, and I guess if anybody would like it, they can have it. Very famous scripture. If you ask if anyone knows the scripture in the Bible, this one will come to mind. So, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so we need a testator. We need the heirs of the promise. We need a death to occasion for a testament to take effect. And we need the testator's signature. And of course we need inheritance. For God, the testator, so loved the world, the heirs of the promise, for those that would enter in and identify themselves with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that he gave. And so we see here that God gave his son to be a propitiation to be sacrificed and to shed his blood so that he could bear the sins of those who would enter into his son's death and resurrection. And the testator, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. And that word there, the signature, is the believing. That we believe the Lord, that's what the Lord wants, and he seals it. It's like a signet, like a signature, but have everlasting life. So all of those legal Attributes can be found, if you like, in this scripture. That's pretty amazing. The Hebrew word for covenant means to cut. It has a suggestion of an incision where blood flows. 
in particularly every case in the word where it is used in the scripture it means to cut the covenant when you do an analysis of all the stories where a covenant was struck in most instances there is a blood covenant Genesis 15 and he said unto them take me in heifer of the three years old and he's speaking to Abram before he was Abraham and a she goat of three years old and a ram of three years old and a turtle dove and a young pigeon and Abram took unto him all of these and divided them in the midst so he's cut the animals and he's divided them and laid each piece one against another but the birds he divided not so if he had birds he could divide them as a whole rather than cut them and when the fowls came down predators like vultures as he cut these the fowls came and wanted to eat of the sacrifice although technically it was an instruction that was given by God as a covenant but Abram drove them away now let's have a look at this word drove I've highlighted that blue for a reason and we see it there in the Hebrew as the reddish brown word that I've highlighted if we can see the little hockey stick I guess oh, not a Hebrew scholar and then we've got the crown and then we've got the end I guess turned on its side all right I don't pretend to be a reader of Hebrew but there it is and it's pronounced Noshab and it means to blow and at Sunday school choruses we may have sung at one time you know God blew with his winds puff 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 and he blew just enough and he opened the Red Sea and Abram it appears as though this word as the action of getting rid of these predators these vultures he also was involved in blowing them away whether that was with the sound that he made or the waving of the hands but there was this thought embedded in that driving them away and when the fowls came down upon the carcasses Abram drove them away Abram the father of faith I'm going to return to this verse when I first read these many years ago I thought why was Abraham the father of faith when we've got Jesus and how could Abraham be the father of faith when he was in the Old Testament surely somebody else would be the father of faith like Christ but Abraham it tells us in the book of Romans is the father of faith and he drove them away it says I want to talk about that carcass again later and I want to talk about what all that means but this is the initiation of the covenant with God finding and following the connection as we jump through the timeline of Bible fulfillment there's a carcass at the beginning and there are birds at the beginning the beginning and the reckoning of the covenant what Abram did there was he established a covenant with God or God established a covenant with him there was a furnace at the beginning and the entrance and a new cleansing birth so Abraham was also given a new name it's like a type of new birth he became um, the identity that God wanted him to be the furnace at the beginning now we're going to read about that in a second and then there's the furnace of affliction at the end and the exclusion or the cleansing of the land there's a carcass at the end for those of you who know your scripture you may know where I'm going with this and then there was also the birds at the end will he find faith Jesus said when he comes back will he find faith and who was the father of faith Abraham was the father of faith who shall stand in the gap and drive or blow away the birds of prey and when the sun was gone down this is after the cutting this is after the cutting of the animals that the Lord had asked him to lay up Abram fell asleep and lo a horror of great darkness fell upon him and he said unto Abram no of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not there now this is a statement of fact to us it's a prophecy and we read this this is in Egypt they shall serve they shall afflict them for 400 years and also that nation whom they shall serve I will judge and afterwards they shall come out with great substance so Israel is going to leave as we know 
with great wealth and substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. And this is a promise that the Lord would look after him and that he'd be buried in a good old age. Genesis 15. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace. So at this inauguration of the covenant came a smoking furnace and a burning lamp and passed between those pieces and passed between those pieces now when my time is up here and I speak again on this same subject I won't go over the same scriptures for those of you who are here you will know what I'm talking about the passing between the pieces in the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. And so more of the land and more of the promise was being unveiled to him, even to Abram. I'm known for quantum leaps. And we're going to leap far into the future. I'm setting a scene here. It's a graphic illustration of how God has done this indeed with his very nation, the descendants of Abraham. And we see this coin here which was struck by Queen Elizabeth I at the gutting of the Spanish Armada. They tried to take England over. It was seen at the time as a contest between Protestantism and Catholicism. But what they were really doing was they were taking on the nation that was backed by the living God. And on the inscription it says, He blew with his winds and they were scattered. And we read of the scripture that accompanied the coin, with the blast of God they perish, with the breath of his nostrils, as in the book of Job, are uh, they consumed away. The roaring of lion and the voice of the lion and the teeth of the lion's whelps are pulled out. The lion perishes for lack of prey, that we should read, and the lion's whelps are scattered abroad. This scripture came into their mind and they were scattered abroad. It was totally gutted. But what was the secret? A, they were the children of God. They were inheritors of the promise. But they also had a heart to seek the Lord. And so this coin here was actually printed by the Dutch, and some of us understand that the Dutch, with their ships, is a tribe of Zebulon. And of course we know that just as much as England is of the tribes of Israel, so that there are nations within Europe, the northern nations, Scandinavians, which are also part of the tribes of Israel. And that was a Dutch coin, and we can see that the nation prayed. Oh, that the nation would pray today. And they will pray, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. They shall pray today, don't you worry about that. It's just they're going to need a little bit of affliction to do that. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. And this is something that the Lord said. And I've always understood the carcass here to be the sad state of the nation of Israel. And that the eagles were the warlike eagles which will be gathered against this nation. And we read about there before the light that came down with the furnace in the midst for as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west so shall also the coming of the son of man be and this will be a period of not an ending of the covenant it may be the end for some but it will be a purging and the covenant will be kept and God will have his way and the people that come through this will be cleansed Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened. Remember how great darkness came when that covenant was struck. This is the inverse of that. And the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Now it was mentioned there before that we thought that perhaps we had something else in mind for the end of man and who would have thought it would have been the, the coronavirus. Well look, you know, this is just the start of it. It talks about pestilence. This is just the beginnings of strives. 
These things are still going to happen that we've been preaching about for years and years. But the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. That word, you can look it up in the concordance, Oranus. And it's where we get the name of the planet Uranus. And that was named number 92 on the periodic table, Uranium. The powers of Uranium shall be shaken. And so that's what's going to come. Man has brought this upon himself. People talk about the destruction that God will unleash. This is what man has done. Man has brought himself to this point. God has allowed it to happen and he will send his son to stop it. Except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. The Bible tells us how that Christ will come to stop it. But this is the ultimate end of mankind. He was given and crowned with honour and glory. He was supposed to be the custodian of this planet. Instead, he's, he's a dismal failure, and Christ will come back to redeem this planet from, from destroying itself. Talks about that in the book of Galatians, I believe, or is it Ephesians? You know, and he will fight against all of them that would destroy the earth. But with the carcass, with the carcass, where is Abraham? Will the vultures be blown and driven away? Who in the book of Joel does it say will be able to stand? And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on the earth? And why is that faith important? It's important for the covenant. Not all of Israel will be the carcass. The remnant, and for the remnant's sake, the faith must be there. I've left that page blank because I'm going to hold you in suspense. I'm going to draw the narrative out. Who will be able to stand? Where is the faith? And where is Abraham? I'm going to leave that question open.